Oh, I say good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, uh, please take a moment and uh, silence or turn off your cell phone really quickly. We have a lot of uh, technical equipment in here, and cell phones will definitely interrupt that. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this post-tax day investment debate. My name is Dr. Brian Lane. I'm the director of your nationally ranked UNT debate team. This is where you apply. Before we go any further, I definitely want to thank CLEAR, as well as the Office of Sustainability, for their assistance in producing the student-run debate today. The debate we're going to cover today is a topic that, as I understand it, actually began from an article in Rolling Stone magazine, an article by Bill McKibben about climate change and investment opportunities. Well, this debate has gotten quite broad since then, and has turned into what we now understand as the divestment movement. What is divestment? Divestment is changing investments from municipalities, colleges, and churches with regard to their own awareness of where their funds are going in certain places. Well, how should we invest funds that are going on from those municipalities, from colleges, and from churches? How should we attend to problems if they are problems, in fact, for the future? Well, that's the subject of a debate. So we have today four members from the UNT debate team who are going to present these issues around the resolution resolved. The divestment is the best strategy for dealing with climate change. Would you join me in welcoming our four debaters? We have presenting for the affirmative side in favor of divestment, Ms. Rika Fink and Mr. Eric Alonzo. Could you stand up for just a moment? We have representing the negative side against divestment, Mr. Darian Doblato and Darian Carroll. It's Darian and Darian and all of you. How will our team of Darians fare against Rika and Eric? We'll have to stay tuned to see. Our format for today is a very simple one, where each speaker will be given an opportunity to speak for five minutes to extol the benefits for their side and the drawbacks for the other side. After the first minute of the speech, you may see some speakers attempt to interrupt the other speakers, raising a point of information. It's their opportunity to try and ask questions. Don't be put off if our speakers at times defer questions in the interest of making their point. This is an accepted practice, and these are all skilled and expert debaters in front of you. We will have one speech by the affirmative, then another by the negative. One speech by the affirmative, another by the negative. Then it'll be time for you to get involved. I'll field questions from our audience that you can direct at one side, both sides, or individual combinations of debaters, if you like, to field our questions on these issues related to divestment. Finally, after we've had about 15 minutes of audience question and answer period, we'll have an opportunity for a final closing statement from each of our two sides in the debate. That will summarize all of our comments. Now, as you're listening to this debate and you hear a point that you believe resonates with you, if it makes a good point, don't hesitate to join in. Our debaters are ready for this. If you want to, you can certainly applaud, but it's far more common in debates to tap on the table. Oh, that's a good point. I really, really enjoy it. Now, if you do hear a point that you don't disagree with from our debaters today, then what you say is, for shame. Oh, for shame. We hope we don't hear that today, right? <laughs> we hope we do not hear that today. Anyway, we're going to go ahead without any further ado and introduce our beginning side of the, of the affirmative team, our first speaker, which will have five minutes to make her case. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Rika Fink. Director of Debate. Uh, this program has given all of us some really wonderful opportunities, so if you're interested in debate, uh, come talk to us uh, afterwards, and we would love to get you involved with our team. So uh, let's, let's begin. Eric and I affirm the resolution. We believe that divestment is an appropriate strategy to deal with global climate change. So 
Dr. Elaine introduced the idea of divestment, and we are going to talk about it in the context of something like a public university. So we have an endowment that is millions and millions of dollars. To grow that endowment, we take that money and we invest it in funds and in corporations. Some of the corporations that we invest in produce uh, and sell fossil fuels. Uh, today, we argue that we have an ethical obligation to divest from corporations that uh, produce fossil fuels and instead use our money and our public clout to press for action on climate change. We will provide evidence to you that fossil fuels are destroying our environment and our future as a species. And by the end of the debate, we will convince you that divestment is an appropriate strategy um, to pursue after this debate round. So when we burn fossil fuels, we pump out carbon into the atmosphere, which causes both the temperature of the Earth's surface and in our oceans, it causes the temperature to rise. Uh, so organisms that live in the ocean, they can't adapt to that rise in the temperature and they die off. It uh, also decreases the amount of oxygen in the water, which leads to ocean acidification. According to a recent study, oceans are now acidifying 10 times faster today than they did 55 million years ago when the most recent mass extinction of marine species occurred. Once these species die off, they are gone forever. At the beginning of your speech, you said that we should invest in other places. My question is, can you give me an alternative that is as reliable as fossil fuels for the money that we have in our endowment? Sure. Let's take Germany as an example. Currently, 30% of the power used by Germany is um, sourced from alternative fuels, which means that it is possible for us to invest and grow uh, alternative solutions to fossil fuels. And one of the largest economies in the entire world has proven that it's possible. But back to our, um, our main points. So all of this is happening before you right now. Fracking in North Texas is a, is a perfect example of this. Um, fracking refers to when you drill holes in the surface of the earth that go 10,000 feet down to where the Barnett Shale is. And then we use um, water that has been combined with sand and toxic chemicals and we blast the water into the shale to release the natural gas. The problem is that after we get the gas, we leave the chemicals and we leave the, the, the toxic substances down there and that can seep into the groundwater and cause pollution. This is why Denton recently passed a ban on hydraulic fracking within the city limits. Um, it can also release dangerous chemicals into the air like radon, which is a colorless and odorless gas that causes lung cancer. Yes. Let me ask you, do you know what the level of the groundwater, how deep it is? I do not know that. It's issue. way above the hole. Right. Well, it, it actually ranges from anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 no. feet is where we where no. we pump. Well, that is the scientific the scientific evidence. The ground. I'm talking about groundwater. Today. Sure, the groundwater. But the fact is, is that these wells where we store the wastewater from the hydraulic fracking, this is not a foolproof um, solution, right? And the more water, the more waste that we pump into those wells, the more dangerous the situation becomes, and the closer we get to you know a, an environmental catastrophe is what is what we would say in this mm. instance, right? Um, and so we would also argue that um, even if if we choose to divest, that doesn't mean that we're losing out on investment opportunities. Um, worldwide, $270 billion um, is invested in renewable energy um, every single year, and that total is growing as the years continue. So uh, renewables already represent about 10% of global power production, which means that if we choose to, we can invest in the future of energy, which is renewables, and use our money and um, the public cloud of our university to press for solutions to climate change. Our esteemed opponents will likely argue that this is a losing strategy, but we have shown you evidence that uh, there is a market for alternative energy, and one that is growing in proportion to the fossil fuel crisis. We have also shown you that our current practices are unsustainable. We we will need alternative energy, and the question is not if, but when we will begin to see these consequences affecting our daily lives, and what we will choose to do when that happens. Yes, David. Uh, you've said that you've given us evidence that there are markets for renewable energies. Sure. What evidence specifically can you give me a citation? Uh, sure, a citation. So um, there was a recent um, uh, Bloomberg article that says that um, the investment in clean energy is actually exceeding expectations in this year. Um, there was also um, a, uh, an NPR article recently about fracking in Texas. We also have this piece of Schofield evidence um, about um, oceans and an ocean acidification. He's a peer-reviewed physicist. So we have a wealth of scholarly evidence to bring to bear in this debate. 
I believe that time is last. Okay. Can I ask one question? What? Can I ask one question? Well, can, you, can you wait till they get Well, I'm going to leave in a little bit. You're going to leave in a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Are you, are you sure? Sure. Uh, how about we'll get one more speaker in and we'll get, the, we'll get a question then, okay? Okay, that's fine. How about that? All right. Okay. Uh, please join me in welcoming. He's a true freshman. New, new, new to the team, Mr. Darian DeBlato. Okay, before time begins, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Um, uh, on behalf of the Native team, we'd also like to thank the Office of Sustainability for sponsoring this debate, and as well our uh, debate coach, Dr. Brian Lane. In the midst of the 21st century, investments play a critical role at the collegiate level. According to Bloomberg Business, over 300 campuses contribute to funds in the fossil fuel industry. If these investments did not exist, over 300 universities would not sustain a competitive and effective learning environment. Therefore, we stand in the opposition of the resolution for the reasons that follow. One, lack of impact. Divestment doesn't have any impact and is merely a symbol of action. It is not worth doing and is a distraction from taking actions that have real impacts. Even if we divest, it won't change anything. According to Eric Hendy, 2009 harvard.edu the conditional wisdom that divestment from south africa was a success public pressure lowered target companies stock prices and forced them to comply with divestment activists however the true impact of divestment from south africa is unclear in a 1999 study ibico and paul wazan examined the impact of divestment from banks and corporations active in South Africa and found that these campaigns had almost no impact on public dominance and publicity of the boycott and the multitude of divesting companies. The financial markets valuations of target companies or even South African financial markets themselves were not easy easily visible, visibly affected. Yes. Okay, so uh, was the apartheid policy of South Africa changed? Uh, it was altered, but so not necessarily... So how do we know that it wasn't because of public pressure like divestment campaigns? It's not necessarily through divestment. There isn't a substantial amount of information that states... But it, the public campaigns did have an effect on overall public opinion, correct? It may have had a small effect, but also you have to understand that we are dealing with the divestment of a different issue as well, so the standards completely change. Uh, to summarize this argument, divestors is not taking any real steps for solving for a problem. Uh, what we are actually doing is trying to make a statement by divesting and hope to see that others will follow. So in essence, what we're saying is, hey, the university uh, should divest in the fossil fuel industries and let's hope everyone else follows this example. So it's no actual guarantee that this is going to happen. Therefore, there is no solution. It is an ineffective and irresponsible step to take. Second argument, lack of alternatives. Investing in other resources may not be efficient and leads to loss of revenue for the university. We're unaware if other forms of investment will be beneficial to the university and its programs. This is a classic case of economic versus accounting profit. Yes, if we invest in other forms and receive an accounting profit, we may receive an accounting profit. However, our loss will be huge if we take away uh, from the fossil fuel industry. So uh, what this argument is saying is that Yes, we may gain a profit by investing in other sources or by investing in other stocks. However, if we don't invest in the fossil fuel industry, there is a big discrepancy. There is a huge loss uh, if you compare the two. Uh, third argument, interference with the university's mission. By divesting, there is a harm placed on education. The money that universities receive are used to fund all programs. So um, according to Bloomberg Business, uh, $32 billion uh, were, uh, Harvard received a $32 billion endowment and $80 million of that was, uh, came from the fossil fuel industry. Therefore, um, if we divest in the fossil fuel industry, we will not have enough funding to, uh, to keep these programs going and to help increase education and increase the competition level of education. So the university goal is to educate their students and provide them with proper programs and research resources to aid their education. By divestment, we are placing a major loss on education. 
Four is the ethicality argument. They make an ethical argument, but we have to ask, are jobs getting produced and who is being affected? Uh, the number one argument in this debate is uh, the ethicality argument and if jobs are actually getting produced. So my opponents have stated uh, we have to act and we have to prevent uh, global warming, but is this the actual proper step to take? Um, five is legislative solution is better. As previously stated, divestment is a symbol of action and is an ineffective way to solve for an issue. The most beneficial way to solve for an issue is through implementation of policy. Uh, so in essence, what my opponents want to do is they want to divest and defund, take an economic action. However, that is not a political action. That is not a policy. They're not passing an actual policy that has actual regulations uh, to prevent, uh, to help aid uh, climate change. Uh, so we have to truly analyze all the arguments I presented uh, in, in this uh, debate and ask ourselves three questions. Who will divestment affect? Will it, harm, will it harm the learning atmosphere of students? And how detrimental will it be towards the job industry? Thank you. All right, thanks, Gary. No, it's okay. okay. I'll leave it to the students. Okay, all right. Uh, we've had one speech from the affirmative side, one speech from the negative side. Let's see if the affirmative side can bring it back. Please welcome to the stage, Eric Alonzo. Yeah. What's up, party people? Uh, let's get started. <laughs> well, my partner and everyone else, I already thank y'all for coming, but I would like to extend that. Thank y'all for coming and watching us this today. I hope you're enjoying it so far, but let's get to it. Alright, um, okay. so our opponents want to make a couple of arguments. First is the ethicality argument. The argument they're making is jobs. Who's going to lose jobs? But the question that they have not taken into account is how does the affirmative policy create more jobs? For example, they, at the end of their speech, they say that the affirmative does not create a new policy, but if they had heard our affirmative speech, at the bottom, at the ending of our speech, we said that we must divest our funding from fossil fuel companies and move them to renewable resources. So even if it is true that we lose jobs from the fossil fuel um, corporations, it's still going to be okay because we moved those jobs to renewable energy sources. So another reason why it is more ethical for the affirmative uh, plan is because of pollution. Our, from the first affirmative speech, we said that pollution is being um, harmed by the fracking. For example, the Denton has already passed an, uh, a fracking uh, law that, does, that bans fracking, obviously. But do those laws actually, are, are those laws actually being implemented? The answer to that question is no. It is, is the affirmative trying to implement a federal policy or just a financial decision through the university? Oh, uh, why not both? Okay, so um, all right. So the next argument that they try going for is it's going to lose the uh, the uh, the way that education is being implemented. But what they have not understood is that there's over 300 colleges in the United States right now, including Harvard, with movements that are trying to divest their universities' money and move them to renewable resources because it's best for the way that pollution is being implemented in the air. So to further explain this argument is for the way that the affirmative has said in the first speech is that. The way that uh, fracking occurs and it leaves toxins in the air and specifically in our water and our land will harm our the way that we uh, the, the drinking water we eat and also the food we eat. For example, the types of fish that we eat uh, from the ocean get polluted. So high level sea level starts to rise really quick, and those species who are that are in oceans will not be able to adapt to that sea level rising, uh, uh, the rapid sea level rising. So and further to do this, we have to create a, um, a propose the affirmative plan. Um, now, they say that it is a response that we're taking an irresponsible step. But then again, we ask the question: How is it irresponsible when we're trying to pre pre provide a better ethical movement for renewable energy resource energy resources? Are um, so today, the Guardian actually released an article this morning that literally states, and I quote: "The coal industry has mounted cynical and misleading campaigns to present coal as a solution to the world um, world poverty." The International Energy Agency estimates more than 1.3 billion people lacking to electricity. Coal power will actively degrade lives. 
Energy poverty overwhelming 84% hits rural areas where they often not extended grid infrastructure. Large energy projects tend to increase capacity to wealthy and uh, industrial, complex, uh, uh, industrial consumers. So basically, who is really going to be benefiting from fossil fuels uh, if, we, if we continue to expand, the, uh, expand this? Is, is it going to be the people who are in need of the energy sources, or will it be in need of, or will it be, uh, be the people who already have those type of energy sources? Is that time? No, it's okay. a minute. A minute, all right. Um, so at the end of the debate, we have to ask the question of: Is it more ethical to lose the way to lose jobs and lose uh, lose jobs right now and transfer those jobs to a better resource for our environment to have clean water to drink, have more fish to eat, and have better jobs for the future? Where are those jobs going, and how do they get transferred, and the when jobs, does that happen? The jobs go to the renewable company, renewable resources companies that are producing that energy. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Be bald. <laughs> he was named an All-American by the, the by the uh, College Debate Association. Welcome to the podium, Mr. Darian Carroll. Yeah, uh, B Lane's way too nice about me. He set the bar way too high. But uh, before we begin, I would definitively like to give a thanks to CLEAR and also the UNT Office of Sustainability for putting on this debate, inviting us here, and engendering such a good and important discussion about how we move forward with the economics of our university. Now with that said, let's get to the fun part. My opponents have come up here and said that we need to have a discussion of ethics, but they have overlooked a very important question. The ethical alignment of a university is the question of creating good scholarship and something that is as accessible to as many people as possible. This ethical question is deeply tied into the notion of divestment because they do not have a response to the question of where does the money go. The question, and my point of information was, can you name another industry that is as reliable and as sustainable as fossil fuels for creating a return on investment that gives us the opportunity to have debates like this one here? My opponent's response to this is, renewable energy companies will just come up with the money. Now, I have a couple of statistics that say that that just does not seem to be true. Let's start with a Bloomberg article published in 2014 that states that renewable energy is being produced by most, by BP, by Exxon. The writing is on the walls. We are all aware that fossil fuels are coming to an end and that we have to move our energies to a different position. But that is exactly why we cannot afford to divest from these industries today. Because another thing that we will learn as times move forward is when we divest, when we take money away from fossil fuels, that's also money away from green energy. That's also money away from solar energy. And this puts us into a place that only leads to a furthering of that apocalypse that they say is coming. Now, I'm going to say something that maybe isn't so popular today. Just give me one second. It's hot in here to me, so I'll say global warming is a problem. But the question here is how do we resolve that problem best? And the only way to resolve that is by investing and by recognizing that that investment allows us to establish things moving forward. Now, Rika, go ahead. So you say that fossil fuel, companies that produce fossil fuels are trying to solve this problem. How does burning coal, fracking, and extracting oil from the ground create renewable energy or solve the problem of greenhouse gases? Great question, right? And you don't have lights on if you can't burn fossil fuels. They also conceded the very implicit argument to say that there is a 10% of the market that is renewable energies in the status quo. Your question then should be, what is the other 90%? This tells us that we need fossil fuels in the status quo as a stepping stone to ever be able to get to renewable energy. So what's your next question? But is that sustainable? Is that sustainable in the long term to have 90% of our fuel come from fossil from fossil sources? That's my argument. That we understand that fossil fuels are not going to last forever. It's not the 50s anymore. But what we also have to understand is that fossil fuel investment in the status quo is important in order for us to get to a place where we can ever develop renewable energies. Uh, this is why the Bloomberg article that, Darian, that other Darian cites in his speech is very good on saying that we have to have these things, that these endowments are important because these endowments are not only how we create higher education so that we can create individuals and give them the type of education they need to develop those future energies, 
energies, but also so that we have the lights on so that we can develop nuclear energy. Now, I'll answer a couple more arguments here. They say the Denton fracking law, I think that this is probably why legislative change is more important than any change that they will ever be advocating for. They can come here and say that we should divest as a university, but Darian's argument about how that is only a symbolic gesture is very good here. Every time they say that the fracking law is somehow important or that that is how we stop the water from being bad, it shows us that there needs to be legislative change and that divestment is not a part of that. Now, I will preempt what will happen in the next affirmative speech where they say that it is all about the way that people influence those policies, but that's the problem. Universities have one thing and one thing to worry about creating education so that our nation can continue to be the best nation possible. That never happens in a world in which universities can't afford to pay great teachers and great professors like Brian Lane and great people like the one sitting in this classroom. So Eric, what's your question? How are you not able to do all of those things with actual renewable energy? Because you are 10% of the market, you are a small portion of the economic advantages that come from things like fossil fuels. You can't fund a uh, you can't fund a project like solar energy with 10% of what is a billion dollars. Now, I have a couple of more arguments I'll answer, so I won't answer any more questions during the speech. Now, they say coal is cynical campaigns. I don't think that demonizing coal is a good response to the jobs that you are going to rob from our citizens and the jobs and educational opportunities that will be left out when we move to a position of divestment. Now, this question in this debate is going to come down to a question of ethicality and a question of what is sustainable moving forward. First off, the more sustainable thing is to develop uh, these technologies, but that never happens if we are able to develop fossil or use fossil fuels and continue to invest in the status quo. But the biggest question that you should answer as an audience is what do we do when we don't have money to pay our students? Do we tell them that we're worried about this big apocalypse that's coming years from now, or do we invest? That's all. I want to say one comment as we move into this uh, period where you have an opportunity to ask our debaters questions. Uh, keep in mind that we've put this on as an opportunity to try and raise the issues that we think are important in divestment. And from time to time, these debaters are playing the parts of devil's advocates. In other words, don't persecute any one individual for an argument that they've made. Now, uh, UNT is an involved university, and as an involved university, we're uh, honored today to have some members uh, come and join our debate from other places. And so I'll give the first question to one of our very special guests here, Mr. Harvey Zimmerman, who is the director of the Institute for Petroleum Accounting. Mr. Zimmerman, do you have a question for us? Uh, you know, on the investment side, particularly where we are right now in the fossil fuel country, Texas, right? So uh, we have a substantial amount of money that's been donated to the university by fossil fuel companies, right? My institute is a million five. In the last two months, we've got over two or three million dollars that have actually been contributed from companies or individuals that uh, made their money in the fossil fuel industry. So if you do the divestiture, do you have to give the money back? And take it further, if you're gonna do the divestiture of the oil and gas companies, meaning the production, exploration production companies, what about petrochemicals? Every plastic in here are much of the uh, bags are made from petrochemicals that come out of the refining process. Do you need to also get rid of those? Then you get even further, transportation companies that transport the oil. Do you need to divest of that? So, I mean, there's a lot of questions when you talk about divestiture, particularly when you're talking here, and I think the affirmative side of, y'all made a great point. I mean, the money comes in here for you guys. So, uh, I mean, the benefits, now the oil and gas companies have returned tremendous amounts of returns in the last several years, say five years. So basically, you know, it's hard, very difficult on that long time frame to earn that kind of money for you. So the question let is, do you divest further? Yeah. And let me, uh, let me repeat just so everybody can hear. Okay. Uh, it seems like the uh, question is uh, really there are three. The first is, does divestment include returning okay. funds? The second is, how far does divestment go? And the third is, what kind of things are included in divestment projects? Do you all have an answer for that? I think it's directed at the affirmative team. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, when we refer to divestment, it would it refer to money that is invested in order to create a return for the university. So in my opinion, uh, donations that were given to the university would not qualify there unless they were expressly designated for investments in something that is related to fossil fuels. Does that make sense? So we would say well, that Well, you got to take it a little further then. What about the people in the companies that are in this area, fossil fuel area, 
that would potentially give us money in the future because we're we we even have a situation maybe that they would donate royalties. Sure. Do we turn that off? Well, and that's di our lots motto of additional money. T is we mean green. So to me, it seems a little bit. I hate to say hypocritical, but it does seem sort of hypocritical to um, champion renewable energy and sustainable solutions, but then accept money from people who burn fossil fuels and pollute the environment. So we should so turn we that say down. That as a university, we have an ethical obligation to um, do what is best for the community at large. And well, we would say that they are harmed by the types of things that companies do with regard to like fracking. But the community is you guys. Yeah. So you're going to turn away people that can't afford to go to the university because we're not going to accept money. I would from say that it is a stretch to say that um, a significant amount of our students would be unable to attend because someone decided not to give a million dollars. We have hundreds of millions of dollars in our endowment, so a million dollars even How much do you think we have in endowment? I looked it up on Wikipedia the other day. It's like half a billion dollars or something. It's no, like several no. hundred million dollars. It's probably more than a hundred million and all we can ever draw is four percent per year. Sure. So that's four four million dollars. That doesn't go I, very far. I in fairness, though, they're, they're trying to defend okay, the position okay, as much sorry. as possible. I, mean, I failed yeah. to, see, to see the ultimate. I mean, I was on the here. foundation board, so they. Sure. You probably I, have I, much I, better information than we do. We're just okay. looking for information okay. the same okay. as all the other students. But I mean, you know, that's all we're doing. you, you got to look at the overall. Scheme of things. Yeah, and we would say that in the overall scheme of things, that it is better in the long run to invest in renewable energy and make sure that we have a future for our children and our children's children than it is to take money from people who burn coal and pump chemicals and sand and water into the ground to get oil. Okay. All right. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah. Yes. So are there are there other potential um, donors then besides we the, the question is, are there any other donors? We should clarify yeah. donation versus investment, right. though. Okay, so I mean, yeah. I guess the it's argument here question. is that if we divest, that people who work for fossil fuel manufacturers would be sort of angry at us, right, and not want to give us money. We would say, number one, that is okay. We are prepared for that prepared for that and we have considered that. Number two would be as renewable um, companies and renewable energy sector as that grows, like in Germany, 30% of their power comes from renewable energy. So there is a future here and we hope that if we invest in those companies that those people will thank us and appreciate us and maybe give us money. Who knows? Okay. Chris. Um, question. Uh did didn't Obama just release that he is actually investing in renewable energy? Did he get money to schools to start programs for renewable energy? Yeah, he has. And we think that that's great, but we think that it's not enough. But wouldn't that help to replace some of the money if the oil comes Oh, I understand. Program? Yeah, it could, yes. Darian? Oh, um... If your argument here is like, can we replace the oil company's money, our argument is that we don't think it is the best option for us to be turning down money that could help us put more seats, put more kids and more seats in our schools, right? So like maybe we could overcome the loss, but my question is why would we incur a loss when we don't have to? That's a fair argument. Mm -hmm. Do you have other questions? Other comments? Thoughts on the debate? Okay, well we have set up in our format it's an opportunity for a closing statement from both sides. I think we're going to start with the affirmative. Yes, we will. Yes. So please welcome back to the stage. Let's read your opinion. Looks like I scared off the guy from the American Petroleum Institute. Hopefully y'all aren't too afraid of us by the end of this debate. Um, so understand this is all just for educational value and we just want to present um, each side of the issue. And so we will um, close off with uh, the affirmative side. So just to summarize, our main arguments are number one, uh, pollution is bad. That doing things that cause the oceans to rise, that cause organisms to die off, and that pollute the water that we drink and the water that we use to grow food that we eat every single day, that that is probably a bad decision. And that we need to do something as an intellectual community of scholars to move away from these practices. 
So uh, our, we affirm the resolution. We believe that we should divest in order to uh, take that money and use it for renewable energy, right? Things that do not involve fossil fuels. Uh, so let's address some of the negative arguments here. So um, Darian says that you know our ethical responsibility is about providing opportunities to our students. And we would say, yes, that is important. Um, and he talks about the opportunities that will be lost if we invest um, this money. But um, you know, the negative never presents any statistics about how much money is actually invested in fossil fuel um, producers, right? Um, there are, there are, I can't think of a single university that has 100% of their endowment or their resources invested in fossil fuels, in oil and natural gas. The reality is closer to about 1% to 5%, right? So that means that we can still divest and maintain um, you know, the standard that students are accustomed to. We're not talking about just taking hundreds of millions of dollars and doing a completely new investment. That is not the idea here. We are going for this symbolism argument, right? That it is important for us as a, as a university and a community to say we do not support fossil fuels, we support renewable energy. That is the question here. And we believe that if enough universities do that, that we can create public support for change that will change policy at the federal level, at the state level, and at the investment in the status quo solves that fossil fuel companies are, are investing in renewable energy, therefore we should continue to invest in them. Well, so think about this. We need to invest in fossil fuels so we can not invest in fossil fuels in the long term. That doesn't make any sense. The fact is that if we give our money to these companies, they're going to continue to drill, they're going to continue to burn coal, and it's not going to create the type of solutions that we want. Um, they say that it's just a symbolic gesture. We wouldn't disagree that this is a symbolic gesture, but you know, um, your own South Africa example shows that symbolic struggles work. That if enough people speak out against something and say this is wrong, we need to change this, that real things can happen, real policy changes will occur. Um, finally, they say that uh, universities shouldn't be involved in this type of activism because it costs money. Um, but this is a fatalistic argument. Universities have been, have been at the forefront of major social movements over the last century, um, from you know civil rights to uh, the environmental movement in the 70s. So we would say that this is the normal state of affairs for university students to be concerned about these things and to want to change the world. Um, finally, you know, they come back to this argument that we're going to basically lose all of our money. Again, the vast majority of our endowment and our resources are not invested in fossil fuel, but we are concerned about the small percentage that is because we feel like it does not represent what we as a community, as a university um, champion, right? We're all about renewable energy and about sustainability at UNT. So we should um, make that clear by divesting from these uh, corporations and these funds. Um, so, you know, overall, we would say that we have a very strong position here because we've shown you that not only is divestment the best idea to support sustainability, but that we can use that money to actually solve the problems that we presented to you throughout this entire debate. We can invest in renewable energy, and we can give that money to people who are working on solutions so that we don't have to burn coal and that we don't have to frack. Um, finally, it would also just be so irresponsible for us at, who, as a community that has banned fracking, to continue to invest in companies that go to other communities and other places in Texas and pollute their groundwater and drill in their fields and make their lives of a lesser quality than it was before. So we would say that this is not only the smartest thing to do, but it is the most ethical and responsible choice that we can make um, at this time. Okay. And finally, our last speaker of the debate, to sum it up for the negative side, Mr. Gary Carroll. Okay, uh, before I start, I'd also like to echo my opponent's statement about how what we're doing here is definitely academic progress, right? We're just here to educate, to learn, and in a good sense, I thank Rika, I thank the affirmative team for bringing up points that I hope have made us all more open to how divestment in oil and natural gas and renewable energies can affect our lives. With that said, let's start the, let's start the fun part. My opponent has seemed to have missed a couple of the most significant arguments in the debate. The first of which is the ethics of the university. I told you a couple of minutes ago that this debate would be about what we should ethically be doing. And I've told you once and I'll tell you again, the ethics of a university is to its students. 
Universities are created so that we can create the type of knowledge and type of education that will allow us to develop these renewable energies we need in the future, but also so that we can put kids in these seats today. And our argument is very clear here that to put kids in these seats, we need to continue to invest in what is the most reliable and sustainable form of investment, and that is fossil fuels. The question again was what else do we put our money into? What is as reliable as big gasoline or big coal? There's no response to this because there is no other thing known that is as reliable as fossil fuels. They also do not have a very good response to the argument about how when we invest in fossil fuels, it actually leads to a larger development of renewable energies. This was the citation of the Bloomberg article in the earlier speech where I talked about how the when, when fossil fuel industries are hit economically, they tend to draw back their level of investment in renewable energies. Their R&D, their research and development. That means every dollar we take away from these fossil fuels is a dollar away from solving the problem of climate change that we all can agree on is a major problem. Now, they say that it's only 1 to 5% of our endowment. 1 to 5% of our endowment, if $100 million is our endowment, sounds like a million dollars. Now, if we look at the UNT's cost of attendance, you're looking at about 20,000 bucks. How many kids could we send to school for a million dollars? How many teachers can we pay for a million dollars? How many debates can we put on for a million dollars, right? These are all of the questions that the affirmative never wants to implicate. They want you to simply say, I feel good that we said we're not going to pollute anymore, but it's not that easy to solve this problem. We have to sometimes deal with things we know are unsustainable in order to fix the problem down the road. And our argument here is that the only way to do that is by continuing to invest in fossil fuels. Now, they say that symbolism to support renewable energy and that we are the mean green and we think green here. And you know what? I think green. We mean green, and you know what the greenest thing is to do? To continue to invest. Because the largest, the, the largest donation that comes to renewable energies in the status quo after the federal government is from large oil and gas corporations. I've told you this before, but I'll tell you it again. They see the writing on the wall. They know that what they're doing now is not sustainable for the future. And that's why they are currently moving toward places that will allow us to sustain this that will allow us to develop wind, energy, solar. And the reason that there's no return on our investment from these current day renewable energies is because they are far too volatile. The amount of money it takes to build a solar reactor, the amount of money it takes to build a wind turbine, and we think we're going to be able to find that where. Our argument is that that can only be found from major corporations that have already established themselves and that those corporations, albeit we may not like it, are currently oil and gas corporations that are willing to work with us to put kids in these seats, research and development into those hands, and renewable energy into the streets. Now, I think that that answers a lot of what they want to say here. But finally, they'll make this argument that I preempted that says we can spill up, that we don't need to worry about that. Our financial changes are going to make a difference. If oil and gas has enough money to give hundreds of millions of dollars to University of North Texas, I think they have enough money to live on if the University of North Texas doesn't want to give them money because they'll just find someone else that will. But what's important, though, is that we recognize that that money can be compounded and can turn into ways that we can battle this large monster of climate change moving forward. Our opponents have not given you a method for how we will beat climate change absent the investment of fossil fuels. We have. We need fossil fuels to beat climate change, and we need fossil fuels to continue to provide jobs and education to allow for things like this debate, to allow for things like hiring wonderful teachers and professors like Dr. Brian Lane, and to allow us to have this conversation. So again, I'll ask you the question, how do we fix renewable energy as a problem with the lights off? Because we don't have the money to pay for it. And if you can't answer that, coupled with the question of the jobs that we are creating in the world of the negative, I think that that's the best way to move forward, but they've also not very well articulated how they deal with the question of legislative. The fracking bill in Denton was only changed through legislative change. That best thing as an institution takes kids out of seats, money out of research and development, and doesn't get us a step closer to fixing the problem. So we say either A, go to legislators, or B, continue to invest, because that's the only way we're ever going to fix climate change. You know, um, there are lots of things in our world right now that we think, okay, I realize that's important, it's crucial, we have to make a decision one way or another, but I don't know what I think of it. It seems to me 
this might be one of those issues. This is a broad-based discussion, a social movement that's popped up within just the last two years. And a lot of colleges and universities are talking about this. A lot of colleges and universities across the country, a lot of colleges and universities, municipalities, and churches are talking about it across the entire world. Um, this is a relatively young discussion for us. We, I want to I definitely express my gratitude to all of our debaters who took a lot of chances in this debate to express the differences of these sides on divestment. Didn't they do a great job, y'all? Come on. Now, if you thought to yourself, you know, this is an important issue, but I'm not sure what I thought. Or, if you thought to yourself, I heard that person say that, and I definitely don't agree with that. That means you might be interested in this issue. You might be more interested than when you walked in and thought, this is easy extra credit, I just got to sit here for an hour. <laughs> if you're interested, if you thought there's more to this than we can cover in this brief hour of debate and discussion, I invite you to come back to an expertly led panel discussion on this same issue. Where is it going to be held, you might ask? Where is it going to be held? It's going to be in this room. <laughs> it's going to be in this room. What time will it be held, you might ask? What time? It's actually going to be on Thursday, which today is a Thursday, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll be in exactly one week. What time of the day will it be held, you might ask? Mm -hmm. What time of the day? Oh, thank you. It's going to be at exactly <laughs> 4 o'clock, the same exact time as this debate. So if you, if you sat back and you heard, oh, that's an interesting issue. Maybe we should think more about that. Or I'd like to hear other opinions on that. We've got an opportunity for you coming up in exactly one week in recognition of Earth Week and its many, uh, many celebrations that we have going on here at UNC. We will have an expert panel discussion on this and other issues related to investment and uh, higher education. It's really the topic that we've got for, to be able to discuss for things. So if you're interested in this, I invite you to come back. I invite you to listen as we have our panel of experts discuss on these different topics and things. Before we leave, I also want to reiterate my thanks to uh, the Office of Sustainability. Thank you, Carla. Great job. And uh, Clear for putting this all together. Can you join me in thanking all of our institutional assistants?